Well, hello there, friends from the internet. This is Scott and Dan attempting for the third time to bring you a beautiful presentation on mineral chemistry. Uh, several years ago, I was on my professional journey as a consultant and had gotten pretty good at biology, but I knew nothing about mineral chemistry. And I happened to catch Dan um, at, a, at a workshop and he set me on a path of learning and understanding that has completely shaped my consulting career. And so what we wanted to do with this show is try and bring that experience to you that weren't able to make it to that workshop and start with, uh, you know, basic history background um, of how we got here with mineral chemistry. And then we'll try and drill down into a little bit more specifics as we go. So thanks if you thanks to all of you that are tuning in. If you're tuning in live, put your comments in the chat and we'll work it into the show. If you're watching at a later date, drop it in the comments and we'll circle back around and try to answer all of your questions. So welcome to the show, Mr. Dan Kittredge. Uh, Thank you for having me, Scott. This has been a, a couple of gremlins here and <laughs> trying to make this 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 course this event happen. But uh, sometimes it thank takes... you. <laughs> Yesterday the power was out. Uh, today we had the, something was going on with the feedback there. But yeah, um, thank you for for doing this on your on your anniversary too. I really appreciate it. It is my anniversary today. I, yeah, like, I have a really. <laughs> She's like, no man, you got to do this. So uh, thank you. maybe thank let's. Her. Let's yeah. start with the yeah, thank you to Sarah, the most amazing yeah. I could ever have. Um, so let's let's maybe start out with a basic history, which you kind of blew my mind when we were preparing for this show of um, of the history of these gentlemen, and you started talking about Weston A. Price and Pottinger's cats, and I was here till three o'clock in the morning the other night going down a Pottinger cat rabbit hole. Um, so I mean. Go ahead and go with whatever you think is a, an appropriate history for our for our listeners to know about as far as who these people were and how it shaped soil chemistry. Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> it's interesting sort of sometimes when you get to understand the history of things. And um, when I when I teach my course these days, I, I teach um, the Albrecht style of of uh, mineral balancing is for a, a sort of a, a foundational piece in that in that side of things. But understanding who Albrecht was, understanding who his contemporaries were, understanding what they were uh, learning and and determining at that point in time. I think those are all really valuable context points mm -hmm. um, because in many cases, people say, oh, here's my UMass soil test. Give me a reading. And I'm like, well, I can't read that language. That's like that's like ancient Latin to me. Like, what do you mean? It's a soil test. Like, well, actually, there's a bunch of different kinds of soil tests and they all have different assumptions that come from different you know, foundational paradigms and assumptions. And so let's really, you know, step back and, and actually have a deeper conversation about, um, you know, the history behind and the, and, the, and, the, and the frameworks and the understandings behind. I like to use the example of maybe a, um, <clears throat> a homeopath and an osteopath, right? A homeopathic doctor is gonna look at your color of your eye, eyeballs and, you know, <laughs> look at your fingertips and see how white they are and say, oh, you have this thing going on. And an osteopath's going to go and <clears throat> call for some lab work. And they're going to, and they're going to say, oh, you got, you got that going on. And so you foundationally have different ways of assessing the human body to come up with the recommendations that you're, that you're, you know, you're providing. And the, the uh, conventional, what we call now conventional, the sort of the land grant university um, model of soil testing is relatively new and it, it is predicated on a certain set of assumptions which are not necessarily biological. They're much more sort of, um, uh, I like to use the metaphor of a, of a uh, uh, IV drip um, model of being fed as opposed to digestive system model of being fed. You can be kept alive on an IV drip if you have soluble nutrients um, in injected into your bloodstream and you can also be kept alive by eating food and having it be digested by your gut flora. Those are two different ways of getting fed. And depending on what your model is, one person is going to recommend a bag of salt water. Mm -hmm. Another person is going to recommend a, a, a balanced diet. Um, and they'll be based on their, their assumptions about how things work and when what's going on. So I think it would be great to sort of start this deeper conversation with um, understanding what the assumptions are behind the people that, I recommend and, and it sounds like you're recommending as well um and so albrecht is the person i think would be great to start with um when we talk about him 
Um, he, as I understand it, grew up on a farm in Illinois. Um, he's a farm boy and he uh, <clears throat> went to University of Illinois for his undergrad work. And then um, I can't remember if it was Iowa or where he went for his, his grad, his grad, grad work. Um, but his grad work was looking at the um, overlays between World War I draft records and um, and and geography. So it looks like the boys that grew up in Illinois were drafted at much higher rates than the boys that grew up in um, Kentucky. And he was like, you know, they both have, you know, whatever English and German heritage. So genetically, they should be relatively similar. Why are we getting different different acceptance rates into the draft based on their geography? Because he was seeing this happen across the country. Like in these bioregions, he was seeing, you know, the acceptance rates are much higher and these bioregions are much lower. Um, and to be accepted into the draft in World War One, you had to basically have, um, like they would test a horse, you had to have good teeth and good feet. Mm -hmm. um, if you had good arches and good teeth and you were fit to be cannon fodder uh, or whatever it was, <laughs> machine gun fodder, uh, or um, then if you, if you didn't, you couldn't. So that was based on, you know, what happened in the Civil War, which was if you couldn't march for 20 miles because you had flat feet, if you couldn't eat art because you had bad teeth, then they didn't watch it because you were a pain in the butt and you weren't worth having around. And so um, for whatever it's worth, that was not relevant in World War One, but but the point was there were different physiological, you know, <clears throat> development in boys that were raised in this part of the country and that part of the country. And and what Albrecht's thesis was, um, this was before we had refrigerated cars, before we had before we had, you know, highly processed food. Basically everything was local, people were growing their own food. It's like maybe it has to do with the soil that people's food is being grown in. Um, if they're genetically coming from similar lineages, if they're effectively eating similar types of food but their bodies are coming out differently then maybe it's coming it has something to do with the soil their food's grown in and um that's you know effectively the foundation of albrecht's work i think there were over 500 papers that he published during his career he was the head of the um soil department at the university of missouri for i think 20 years or something mm -hmm. um so a a well-credentialed land-grant university researcher who uh prior to world war ii was part of some really wonderful work that the USDA and the land-grant universities were doing in supporting farmers and understanding how to have things do more well. Um, you know, his research effectively, he would take soil, clay, put it through a centrifuge, spin out all the, um, the, the cations, all the calcium, the magnesium, the potassium, and then he'd add back in at certain levels and ratios, you know, 50% calcium base saturation, 10% potassium, 5% um, Magnesium, 75% calcium, 20% potassium, 5%, whatever. Different. He would just ex experiment with different levels and ratios of minerals in that soil colloid. Then he would grow those crops out, um, grow, grow the corn or grow the wheat out in that soil. And then he'd feed it to, you know, these to these rats and those to those rats, these to these pigs, those to those pigs. And watch over generations to see if he could find that, that same shift in physiological development in the in the farm animals that he was noticing in the draft records and lo and behold uh yes you know when you had these certain levels and ratios the animals they were fertile you know they grew rapidly they had big litters they were friendly um cuddly when they had these levels and ratios of minerals in the soil then they didn't reproduce well they grew small they were aggressive um he could he could he could shift the way that the animals developed based on the nutrients that were in the soil that their food grew in mm -hmm. and that to me is a very powerful powerful insight and i love the fact that it was done i mean he grew up on a farm i think he's got common sense you know I'm, I'm biased towards farmers but but the fact that he used the western national framework and sort of was able to categorically show that um there's something going on here um <clears throat> And that's sort of, I like to sort of hide behind that. Um, he had contemporaries, which are some of the other slides you've got there. Um, um, uh, Weston Price, who, as I believe it was, I think he had, you know, helped to develop the, the uh, root canal. Um, he was a dentist. Uh, he was a cutting edge dentist. He was like on the, you know, a leader, the, you know, a leader. Um, 
he developed the root canal. 30 years later, he saw the root canals failing. Um, he was coming to the end of his career and said, um, there must be more to it than this dentistry we've been practicing. And he and his wife went on a trip around the world to find humans that had, that didn't have, um, didn't have, <laughs> didn't have cavities. <laughs> all the he would, you know, they got all the, well, right, exactly. And so they went and they went and they, um, <laughs> the, the, if you had to be, they would take a picture of every person in the village's teeth yeah. and count the number of cavities. Yeah. And <laughs> if you had less than one cavity in a hundred teeth, so that would be out of every three people, you have one cavity or less wow. in the whole village. Wow. <clears throat> if he could find, if, 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 if that was his standard, if a village had less than one, one cavity in three people, then he would study them to see what they were doing to have healthy teeth, because obviously it wasn't happening in the States. Wow. Um, and you've got the list there of the parts of the world that where he found these villages and they were all over the place. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, yeah. if you show that, put, put that slide back up there. Yeah. I think you can. Switzerland. Um, uh... Uh, remote village in Switzerland, Gaelic communities in the Outer Hebrides. Outer Hebrides. Yeah, what's that? Northern, yeah. Outer Hebrides, those are, those are um, it's, uh, Scotland. Those are islands off Scotland. Mm. Um, indigenous people, North and South America, Melanesia, Polynesia, African tribes, Australian Aborigines, Maori. Yeah. Um, so he was like, okay, so something's going on here in all these, in, in all these different areas. And he was trying to figure out what it was. And he was like... <clears throat> Is it your politics? Is it your economics? Is it your food? You know, what, what he was like, yeah. is it your soil type? Is it your geography? He's like, he was like doing a full survey of what these cultures had in common. He's like, there must be some, some common ground here. And I mean, the short answer is it was lacto fermented foods, foods that were pre digested by microbes that, um, where people had healthy gut floras, I think is the, if you want to take sort of one short line out of it, they all, all these people, they they fermented their milk. They they fermented their their grains, their vegetables. They they were they had an actively positive um, <clears throat> microbial dynamic going on in their food supply. Uh, but anyway, so so Albrecht and um, Price, Weston A. Price, were contemporaries. Um, people may have heard about um, a Pottinger, Pottinger's cats, where he was taking milk and what was he doing? He was cooking it. Oh my god! You, you, you've read this more recently than I have. I haven't read his work well, recently. Yeah, I, I watched the whole. I was here till three o'clock in the morning watching the document. Yeah, I'm blown. The, the short the short answer is uh, uh, Pottinger's father was studying adrenal extracts from cats with some sort of disease. I forget what it was. Uh, Sarah's probably saying it over the phone. She told me last night, but I didn't hold on. To it. <laughs> but anyways, Pottinger carried was carrying on his father's research. And there was a standard um, diet for this process that science used. And he just kept seeing a high mortality rate. And something happened where, um, uh, what is this? It says it right here. Um, he says uh, uh, he ordered raw meat scraps from a local packing plant and started uh, feeding that to them on a second group. And they had significantly better survival rates. And that completely yeah. transitioned from we're doing adrenal extracts for some sort of treatment to we're going to study nutrition and that went for 10 years and um you know so basically they all got one third of their diet that standard scientific formula for keeping cats alive in a lab <clears throat> and then the other two thirds was one of like six or seven different uh which ranged from uh whole milk or raw milk pasteurized milk sweetened condensed milk the sweetened condensed milk so pasteurized and sugar added uh, within a generation or two started having like radical abnormalities. Um, yeah. it's kind of crazy. The videos they show online too, cause they videotaped all like they'd flip them. They'd kind of fling them like a beanbag toss. And you know, the ones that had the, the raw diet would land perfectly. Land their feet. Yeah. The other ones would kind of <laughs> they would kind of bounce weird. And you're like, Whoa. <laughs> do you want to maybe turn the dinger off on your phone? That was going pretty. Oh, annoying. sorry. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. That was pretty short. Mm. Um, but yeah, he, he, they would then do a various set of observations. They, um, examined the skulls, the skulls started deforming. And basically, pasteurizing the milk and adding sugar was remarkably destructive to genetics. And he would then go that through several generations, and then he would try to repair them at the end. And from what I remember, 
the groups that got the poorest fed diet would take four generations to get back to normal or right. Yeah. And it just was like this rabbit hole. And the funniest part is like how people kept dropping off cats. They're like, Oh, you're doing a cat surgery here. You know? And they just, <laughs> there would, there would be cats on the porch. And, uh, <laughs> like, well, we got some more cats. Let's try our temple group. And but the, but the point here is this is all being done in like the twenties and thirties and forties. Correct. Right. The 19th. So we're like almost a hundred years ago. Yeah. When we've got these different researchers that are doing all this, all this um, assessment and, and, and really finding out that like, you know, what you eat has a lot to do with your physiological function and mm -hmm. epigenetics. Like if you eat poorly, your kids are going to be less healthy. And if they eat poorly, your grandkids are really going to be not healthy. Yeah. And we connected it to soil, we connected it to microbiome, we connected it to, to the way food's pr produced. All that stuff is like, it's decades old at this point, mm -hmm. right? I mean, my father just turned 80 yesterday. This was like stuff we knew when he was born. So, um, and they were, I think it's really like they were, that? and they were concerned then, you know what I mean? Like that's like, they were seeing things physiologically and, degenerate at that point in time. And that was, right? and, be, and they didn't have chronic epidemic levels of chronic disease then like mm -hmm. we have now. And that was part um, of the revolution. That's what's so concerning. Like this was even happening before they started all this chemical agriculture. And yeah, my God, we got a long way to go. So, <laughs> so just that there's a historical foundation of good science yeah. that's like epidemiological in nature, looking at patterns mm -hmm. and, and really founded well on like, you know, if you work well with nature, good things will happen. And mm -hmm. this is, and, and if you don't, bad things will happen. And you know, so it's, for me, it's just, it's heartening to know. I mean, and, and, and Rodale, J.I. Rodale was, was hanging out with these guys and mm -hmm. Lady Eve Balfour, who's, you know, the founder of the Soil Association in, in the UK. And these are all contemporaries. These are all contemporaries sort of engaging in this, in this deeper conversation, um, which now we've got regenerative over here, we've got organic over there, and we've got the, you know, uh, permaculturalists. And um, I don't know, any of them are really looking at this mineral balancing stuff. Right. Well, I mean, they're sort of like, we've got, we've got, you know, I'm following Rodale. Well, I'm following whatever. Um, so yeah. my, my observation as an analyst of all strategies. So we, we get all strategies filtered into our office and we get to mm -hmm. put the test to all of them. And which is sometimes why I guess I'm a controversial figure because it's pretty unattractive for a lot of these strategies. And uh, what's interesting is how many the results of a lot of these strategies are. Oh yeah, yeah it's it's a horrible. What you're trying to say? It's horrible. Just because it. somebody thinks it's a good idea doesn't mean it works. Yeah, and because the internet agrees doesn't mean it's not going to be the best way to go out of business, right? <laughs> and um, so, I think that's why I ruffle a lot of people's feathers because I I just care about results. I don't care if you stood on your head and spun three times or prayed to the moon or got your data is your god i just i'm about what creates quality nutrient density and sustainability that's the only thing i care about mm -hmm. and um what's interesting is one thing that really comes to my mind as you say this is these guys were all working together that is not the case now who like you have some relationships i have one contemporary that we work really well together other than my wife the rest it's it's very uh uh what would you even call it you know yeah yeah, yeah, but, spread apart. Yeah. yeah, not working together. Not, not, not coherent. Not, not, <laughs> yeah, not, not cohesively working towards a goal like these people were. Were sharing research and sometimes sharing the funding of that research, and then all working towards a common goal of what makes human healthy and and what makes uh, resilient crops. And man, yeah. So, so basically anyway. had these. Yeah people in the 20s, 30s, and 40s that said, hey, man, there's something we got to look into here. They were voicing concerns. What's even more interesting that pops in my head, it's kind of a little out of order, but with Pottinger, the final thing that they did was after they abandoned the study, they noticed that different plants grew in the different pens where the different sample groups were. Yeah. That was very interesting. And um, in the pens where the animals were fed a wholesome, uh, full, raw, diet grew plants um in the worst sample group it barely grew weeds and they show <laughs> images of the different crops and they're like oh this is fascinating you know what i mean like yeah you know yeah so yeah. they weren't just sharing concerns they were sharing solutions right right <clears throat> i mean weston a price was like this is how you balance your diet to have 
you know, to be healthy. Albrecht was like, this is how you balance your soil to have your plants be healthy. They weren't just identifying things that were wrong <clears throat> or that were going wrong. They were saying systematically, we've done a lot of proper scientific research and we're finding some patterns that we want to share. And, um, and I don't know exactly what went down with price, but I know with Albrecht, uh, post World War II, when we had all these, um, companies that were manufacturing explosives and chemical weapons. Um, and then there was no need for those things anymore because the war was over. Those companies said, we don't really want to go out of business. <clears throat> Let's see if we can find an alternate market for our product. And so, uh, insecticides were just nerve gas. You take the nerve gas and you call it insecticide. They didn't change the chemical compound. Wow. They just changed the name of it. And that's, and that's where, and that's where our insecticides come from. They, you know, they take the ammonium nitrate and all things like that, um, that were the ingredients and explosives. They just said, let's try putting this on the ground. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't say like, what would be good for the ground? They said, our factory is designed to make this thing. Let's see if we can sell it to farmers. And, um, and so they would go out and they would give farmers these free fertilizers and, you know, it's like the drug, drug, you know, dealer strategy, you know, here, try some heroin, you know, right. tell me how you feel next week. See if you want any more here, it's free. Um, <laughs> two or three years of free fertilizer, the crops are growing much more rapidly. People are like, oh my God, look how rapidly the crops are growing. They went out and they strategically gave it to the farmers that they thought had the best reputation in, in town. Um, they got much better yields. They told everybody a couple of years later, they started to get all this pest pressure. They're like, here's this free, free uh, insecticide. And the farmer was like, wow, this really works. And so it was a real, it was a real like a drug dealer strategy. Mm -hmm. And then, and then they went and they started giving um, money to, to the land grant universities and endowing chairs and building buildings and saying, um, you know, here's a bunch of money. If you'll study this, study the value of this fertilizer or the mm -hmm. um, value of this insecticide. And oh, by the way, you have to fire this guy and this guy who are saying things that are not what we want you to know and so um which is that's what happened to albrecht what's that which is still the strategy so <laughs> yeah well but they they didn't have like when albrecht was was running the university of missouri soil department you know mm -hmm. he was a he was in charge at the land grant university soil department at that in that state and <clears throat> his phd students were were getting jobs in connecticut and various other places so he was he was setting up a, a lineage of his students who were taking this insight and bringing it forth to the different language universities around the country. Um, and they were all systematically removed. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and that brings us maybe to Charles Walters, who was the founder of Acres USA, um, who um, was an absolutely brilliant man. Um, and, you know, he, for whatever reason, started, you know, tracking down all these people that were still alive. He started Acres in the 70s, early 70s. Mm -hmm. um, so these people were still alive and and brought their work back. Um, so as I understand that, as I understand the story, Albrecht, Albrecht would have died, you know, <clears throat> with his work lost if 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 um, Charles Walters hadn't 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 brought it forth. So and there's a bunch of agronomists now people have heard about. I think you've got a couple there, they're Neil Kinsey. And mm -hmm. I was just thinking uh, Gary Zimmer would be on that list too. Right. Um, um, this is the Reem side of the story. So we can talk about the Reem side of the story in a minute. Um, but um, yeah, anyway, so there's a, there's a, there's a lineage of people who have taken this work and brought it forth. Uh, Jerry Brunetti, obviously. Um, 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 and, and that's, that's effectively what I teach when I, when I teach a, a two day course about how to, how to take a soil test and, and, and make recommendations. The other side of the, in the acres world, at least in the biological ag world, um, you can take the Western rational science people and they call it the Albrecht camp. And when I started going to acres in the early 2000s, <clears throat> there was like a, there were two camps. There was the Albrecht camp and the Reams, Reams camp. And Kerry Reams was a, um, I think he was a clairvoyant, actually. He was, you know, he, it, it was extremely intelligent. Um, he, had worked with Einstein. I think the story goes, I'm not sure if it's apocryphal, um, that when he met Einstein, he said, you know, so well, uh, you figured out how to take things apart, you know, ha ha ha, like, i.e. the atom bomb, how do you put things back together again? 
And then how do you create matter? You know, you can take matter apart and release the energy from it. But the, his, but Reams's question was, how do you take energy and and create matter from it? And and the story goes that that Al said to Carrie, "Well, that's your job, Carrie. Figure it out." And um, he came up with what's called the Reams biological theory of ionization, um, <clears throat> which still talks about yep, <laughs> still talks about calcium and magnesium and potassium and nitrogen but talks about them in an entirely different language. He talks about Milhouse units and um, the way in which you get a Reams test done it uses different acids and bases than the way you get an Albrecht test done. And so when you have an Albrecht test that says you got 750 pounds of calcium, you can't take a Reams recommendation from that because they're, they were just, they were assessed in different ways. Um, so Personally, I found my, my, I was most intrigued by, by Reams when I first started learning about all this stuff. I was like, wow, this is totally cool. Yeah. And he wasn't just working with ag in ag agronomy with, with farmers. He was also working with nutrition and health. And he was, he worked with a lot of people and he helped cure a lot of, you know, stage four cancer and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, you know, brought forth the conductivity meter and the refractometer. If you've ever heard about bricks. <clears throat> We track down, you know, the BRICS chart, it goes to Carrie Reams. Um, you track, if you saw conductivity, if you've ever assessed that, that's, that goes back to Carrie Reams. He was one of the first people to, to, to bring that to bear. One of the things he talks about is this Millhouse units, the sort of, I mean, we don't know who Millhouse was. There's no, doesn't seem to be any, like, we can't find who Millhouse was, like, <laughs> but, he, but he refers to them as Millhouse units. And he talks about, you know, some calcium will have 230 Millhouse units and some calcium will have 20. So just because it's limestone doesn't mean, even if it's calcitic limestone, just because it's calcium carbonate does not mean it has a lot of energy in it. And he was very interested in <clears throat> the energetic nature of the substance that you're working with. Um, some gypsum has no energy. Some gypsum has a lot of energy. It's not just about the calcium. It's just, and then there's the different types of calciums. Right. Um, he talked about male and female energies and some elements will cause things to flower and fruit and some things will, some elements will cause things to, to you know, have more leaf growth, um, all of which seems to be borne out by people who have tracked this down and 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 followed it. And I think you've got a picture. Yeah, I, of can Arden and... I can tell you that anything I've functionally applied from Kerry Reams from my body to the farm has worked like under yeah. that undeniably has worked now to the degree which with I understand it right it's it's pretty far out compared to the technical hydroponic world that I come from and so it I wouldn't I wouldn't say that I've ever comprehensively applied the full carry ream strategy because I'm not gonna say that I understand all of it um, but I will say the the thing that worked the thing that really like there's been these points in my career where I was like whoa and um, we were working with a farm that had a nursery with a lot of production capability, high plant counts, high speed, high rotation, lots of repetitions. And the guy was very respected for what he did. And I was reading this book at the time. And I, I think he, I think he, what he says is, from what I remember, that the center of all plant cells um, is a nitrogen, a carbon, a calcium, and then everything else. And I was thinking about that one morning, mixing up the fertilizer recipe, and I'm like, I have not put any calcium in here. <laughs> like I've not, there's no calcium in here. <laughs> yeah. This is working well, but there's no calcium. And so what I did was, um, oops, sorry, one. And then, uh, so what I did was I started those plants with the carbon and the nitrogen and the calcium. And then the next day I did all the other fertilizer. So in that one week's group's worth of plants, I just changed the order of their nutrition to that very first day after transplant included some carbon, included some nitrogen, included some calcium. And then the next day came with all the other stuff. Undeniably, that was the leader. And that particular gentleman was managing 26 different farms. And uh, it immediately got implemented to all 26 farms <laughs> the next week. And I was like, whoa. Yeah. <clears throat> That's the thing about Reams <clears throat> is, you know, people who've really tried it are like, oh my God, it works. Mm -hmm. And they're like, how does it work? What's the science? And we're like, there's no papers. He right. didn't, he didn't publish papers. He didn't do side by side replicated randomized, randomized trials. He downloaded from mm -hmm. the ether and he got answers. He looked and he saw, I remember talking to Dan Scow about him. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure this must have been 15 years ago. And, um, <clears throat> and he said, I was like, what's it, what was it like? What was it like being around Carrie Reams? And he's like, 
when he focused his mind and he was when you gave him a question and he when he had didn't know the answer and he, he sat there and he thought it's like you could almost feel the rumbling it was like his mind was so powerful that it just like caused the earth to shudder while he was like delving into this question i was like oh my god that's so cool that's just totally cool but 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 there's no published papers there's no western national science you can't replicate it you can't you can't prove it quote unquote right. um and so you know depending on if you want to hide behind that western national scientific framework or not um the reams method is is one that it doesn't doesn't have the citations behind it whereas the albrecht one does so um anyway i think we're planning on talking more about albrecht yeah. today than reams but i certainly hope people have heard about reams and yeah um uh, Reams Biological Theory of Ionization, RBTI, is something you can look up. Um, um, it's not a lineage which has been carried forth very well, I would say. It's sort of struggling, but um, but yeah, there's amazing things. <laughs> and one of the other things about Reams was he didn't care if something was natural or not. Right. He didn't care if it was organic. He's like, calcium nitrate is an energy. Mm -hmm. If you C need some of that energy, use it. If nature's Nature doesn't care if something's certified organic or not. And that was like a big deal for me when I was first getting into all this stuff was like, I, cause I grew up on an organic farm and my parents ran an organic farming organization and I knew organic was better. And here's somebody who's like, you know, quality is the thing, flavor, soil health, biological activity are the things. And you don't have to use just certified organic things to get there. In fact, there's a lot of things that, that are products of industry, which can really help you get there. And that's, so that really helped me sort of question a lot of my foundational assumptions um and but i do still go back to the to the point about bricks um you know i have not seen yet any other better empirical metric for verifying overall system function than refractometer than a, than a bricks refractometer mm -hmm. and um a lot of organic farmers are getting low bricks readings and a lot of reams based producers are getting high bricks readings and um, that does correlate with flavor, it correlates with shelf life, it correlates with soil health, it correlates with farm viability. Um, and so, <clears throat> yeah, it just, if we want to, if we want to think about breaking outside of some of our boxes, um, um, having some metrics that we can use to assess overall function and, and, and not have to be locked into our philosophies about the way things have to be, I think is probably, is probably helpful. So. Yeah. When I, when I went down the major rabbit hole of bricks, um, obviously our strategy is put it to the test. I don't have any emotions about any of this stuff. I find the information, I put it to the test, examine its value and keep it or ditch it. And yeah. we started getting into uh, the bricks. Uh, some of the old information talks about um, a product. I think it came from International Ag Labs called a maze. Yeah, which, yeah right. And so mm -hmm. that was one of the products that made it kind of easy for um, – for farmers to increase the bricks. And, and basically what I've distilled down from the information is in order to increase the bricks value, you have to increase the production of sugar, which basically means you need to increase the uptake and movement of phosphorus. And that Amaze product has calcium and phosphorus in it. I think AEA tried to make a similar type uh, product I'm not familiar with. I have some other things that I use now that do the same aspect. When, when we were starting to mess, mess with bricks, that's when I was becoming uh, competent at the soil food web. And that was the only way I was able to increase the bricks was by changing the relationship between predators and prey. So things that eat bacteria to convert those nutrients. And that was the only way I was able to get it to move up. And I think what happens with organics specifically is in order to increase the movement of phosphorus, you need to either be an expert at mineral chemistry and timing or you need to start functionally incorporating some biological premise, which most people don't. So you see not that many people functionally move that needle, I guess. So I think I, I see people get frustrated. So they get inspired with the BRICS process. They, they're they bummed out about their three, fours, and fives. Um, you know, try the couple things that they know and that didn't move it. Well, if the things that you knew moved it, you'd already be moved, right? So we have to, <laughs> so, right? We what's have, the surprise we, there? <laughs> right. You know, which I yeah. actually have a box full of uh, squishers and refractometers that people get into it and get frustrated and then end up mailing them to me. And, and I would just like to see people 
have more success with it simply because that sets you on the journey for, you know, you're, you're moving the needle now when you get those numbers to move. Right. And in the field, I would agree that's a solid handheld, uh, farmer actionable tool. You don't need to send it in the lab. You can do it yourself. Um, yep. it's just, it's hard for people to move it with what they've been doing. <clears throat> in and, and you know, so hundred percent, you got these three products, you've been sold by this salesperson and you've been using every year and you're used to diseases and you're used to the level of thriving you've got, the level of yields you've got. Mm -hmm. And when you see it, when, you, when, a, when a plant gets to 10, 11, 12 bricks, it starts growing at speeds and producing at quantities that you've never, yes. I mean, never comprehended before. Mm -hmm. It really is just like, like, oh, there's a fifth gear, you know, like, I didn't know my car had a fifth gear. Now, now I can drive on the highway. Like, you know, it's just like, um, so. Uh, I, yeah. I, call, I call it the fish stories region. You, you enter into the state of results that people immediately dismiss you and say you're lying because they don't believe it. Um, yeah. but one, I've one... been thinking, I've been thinking this year I should do this on my, yeah. on my, uh, the, the BFA's land, um, yeah. is, is take everybody I know who's an agronomist um, and I know a few of them out there and say, send them a sample of my soil and say, take, take my soil and give me recommendations and sell me your products. And I'm going to do your, your protocol against your protocol, against your protocol all the way down the field. And let's just see who's out there. Who's got good stuff. Um, because it, until you see a seven foot tall egg plant, you know, or a pepper plant with a bushel of peppers on it. You know, literally, how big does a pepper plant have to be for there to be a bushel of peppers on it? Right. Like, if you've never seen a pepper plant that big, you wouldn't comprehend that it's possible. So, so the more we can do that, we if those of us who think we know what we're talking about can lead by example and actually just do some of that work. I, I'm I'm going to try to do it this year. You really let, grow exceptional plants. You let me know um, when you're ready. I'll be the first one to sign up for that. I would love that. Okay. Um, well, let's I mean, let's do it. This is I, I'm serious about this because I, it's incumbent on us if we think we know what we're talking about to show it. Yeah. Right. Stop talking. Start, 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 start. <laughs> well, that, that, that's why I get so fiery because like I come from the sports industry. If a professional athlete goes, zero and 24, that's going to be all over the news for three weeks. It's not. Yeah. You know, agriculture lives in this like shrouded hidden world. And it's like, you know, I think, you know, if we're all going to be professionals, other professional realms have accountability. And I think a certain reasonable accountability to things you say would do agriculture wonders right now and 100 uh, percent. yeah 100 percent. yeah uh real quick let's just touch how does how does arden anderson play into this um because he was really influential to me i feel like he took the complex of reams and turned it into a little bit more i don't know mainstream is the right word but yeah i mean i would say arden was one of the next generation of reams students um i think he married reams's daughter I'm not sure. There's definitely a personal relationship there. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, you know, he was, he grew up in Michigan um, on a farm and, and there was a, a bunch of this bubbling up there. Reams was giving courses all over the country. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was Arden's two day course. that was a pre-conference at Acres. I think it was in 2006 where John Kemp and I were both, in that course sitting next to each other i was i was whatever i was 20 29 and john was 19 18 and we were both sort of just coming off the farm just trying to figure it out getting exposed to all these things and you know arden arden was the one who really um called it all out and said there's way more going on here guys than than you've ever heard of and mm -hmm. You know, he was a little bit fiery. He was <laughs> a little, a little angry, a little aggressive in his in his in his demeanor. But you know, um, but knew what he was talking about. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a few others that were doing stuff in Iowa that I haven't heard much about recently. Um, yeah, uh, Schlotko and and Latrell and stuff like that. But um, yeah, the, I would say the Reams the Reams uh, method has has been less well um, less well brought forth. Arden's still out there. I think he's doing more health work, more nutrition work now than he's doing agronomy work. I haven't talked to him recently. Yeah. Um, Neil Kinsey, Neil Kinsey was a was an absolute uh, was a direct student of Albrecht's, uh, one of one of Albrecht's few still alive 
um, direct students. And he's been working globally for a long time for, to great success. I think yeah. he's based in Nebraska. Is he based? I mean, somewhere look. out, somewhere out there. Based in Charleston, Missouri. Missouri. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, and I, uh, cause, and then out of that came like Brookside Labs, right? So out of Albrecht and Kinsey had something to do with Brookside Labs or something. And then Brookside. But, I'm not sure where Brookside came from. Yeah. I know it's part of that. Yeah. Cause that I know, base saturation that we use something, something out of, I think the way I read it was, well, I don't want to give bad information. It's entirely possible. Yeah. I know, I know that, that Jerry Brunetti was actively involved in helping set up Logan Lab. Um, uh -huh. um, that's why I started telling everybody at BFA they should take a Logan Lab test because that was one he was, he had set up where we could look at molybdenum and cobalt and everything else from the Albrecht perspective at a cheaper price than any of the other labs that were out there. Um, that's what we do. Yeah, we do the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I appreciate about Logan that, uh, is as a cannabis cultivator, most people would hang up the phone on you if you tried to get lab tests. That's why a lot of the cannabis injuries industry is so resistant to testing is because we were not even invited to the party and you'd get hung up on. Logan has always answered the phone and talked to me like an agronomist when nobody else mm -hmm. had. So yeah. I have a lot of appreciation for Susan over there. I probably warned her yeah. out and people to talk to her, but she would, <laughs> she would come over and she would answer my questions and she'd speak to me like a farmer. And I, I just have a lot of appreciation for that. And then further, more importantly than that, I'm about the numbers. When you do the math as it is of just generally accepted math processes, the Logan data works out. I've tried Spectrum, which they're great people. They're very supportive as well, but their numbers don't line up with the math. Mm -hmm. And so using the Logan result, you can action on that math, which maybe be a good segue into some of the basic principles of the Some actual numbers start yeah. talking about people and start talking about the actual things that people can take home. Yeah. I think it's all amazing. But I, I think this, like, I love the story stuff. I like to know like, what, what are we even talking about here? You know what I mean? So, um, but I think an important topic to cover real quick is just what an acre slice is. So last week we mentioned, you know, it's two. Why, what is an acre slice? Why, why are people, why do people want to know what an acre slice is? Well, I think the important aspect is if you're going to do mineral chemistry, you're dealing with pounds per acre and parts per million, which is a weight by weight comparison. So it's the weight yeah. of the soil compared to the weight of the minerals in that soil is what derives a pounds per acre or a part per million. So in order to quantify appropriately and change effectively, you need this mathematics to be in line. So exactly. Yes, yeah. we define it as a slice. And so it's whatever shape your acre is by six inches. So some people feel it's 660 by 66. Some people say it's 208 by 208. I learned at two o'clock in the morning the other night that it's how far you could plow with an ox in one day. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, seems legit, seems legit. I, I would think you could go more than 600 feet with an ox in one day, but I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> either way. I never knew. <clears throat> Oh, and yeah. just, just some other basic math. So the assumption that the lab is making is that that six inch slice is going to weigh 2 million pounds. So that anchors the weight of the soil to compare. And, and, and the reason they're thinking six inches, right, is because they're assuming that six inches is the depth of the aerobic zone. Yeah. And so the thought is wherever you have subsoil compaction, your roots can't get through. Um, your plant's not being fed. So where, whatever is down below that area where you've got subsoil compaction is irrelevant. Yeah. So if we're using a soil test to try to figure out how many nutrients are available in this, in this piece of land for your crops to grow from, um, we have to choose a point at which the roots can no longer reach. And so if you've got good soil structure, this whole six inch concept is, is very flawed. You have much more potential there, then a soil test is going to tell you. But but if you're going to do a, a sort of a systematized, standardized process, you have to have some expectations. And one of them is, one of the assumptions is that you're only looking at the top six inches. So, yeah. Yeah. And, in, and in my practical application of this math is that's what seems to be the depth that you can affect with mineral amendments applied to the soil. And so it, in my experience, it also keeps the math straight. So if we calculate for depending on the situation, four or six inches of that acre slice of the volume that we're trying to amend, when you put the amendments on top of that soil, the math stays uh, consistent. And so <clears throat> what's really interesting is then, like if you calculated for a full 12 inches and you put the minerals on top, 
you would actually hyper concentrate them and you would miss your marks because it's not actually penetrating 12 inches. And then when we end up going down and excavating, if we've balanced the top six inches for a period of time, usually below that is also balanced. And I'm not going to say I understand how that works, but that's just what I observe. Um, Slow and steady wins the race. Yeah. Just because some is good does not mean more is better. Um, right. And yeah, I always like to put my minerals down in the fall mm-hmm. when along with my cover crops or whatever, and hopefully that the earthworms are going to be helping to mm-hmm. cycle them up and down and around. But yep. yeah, I generally 100% agree, regardless of what the exact numbers are, just because some is good does not mean more is better. Correct. I call that the moron principle. And I would say that more is actually worse. And in, in my in my the moron, life, the moron principle, like you're a moron. <laughs> you just keep if you. Yeah. Well, what I yeah. found in our work is be, because of these smaller scales and historically higher profit margins, cannabis farmers are much more inclined and apt to put way too much on. Yeah. And yeah. what was interesting about the base saturation aspect is if you take a soil that has a low mineral content, but it's balanced on the base saturation and compare that to a soil that has three times the mineral, but it's not balanced, the bigger one will perform poorer. And so yeah. the, the, yeah. Hyper, the, the, the functionality of balance is far more effective than, um, than uh, just quantity. And so because 100%. we're talking about a 2 million slice, it takes two pounds. So a part per million is one in a million. So it takes two pounds yeah. of minerals, in 2 million pounds of soil to make one part per million. Um, and then just some other numbers to try and, because some of our listeners are talking about acres, some of them are talking about cubic yards of soil. And so, you know, generally speaking, a six inch slice of an acre is about 806 cubic yards. And we're talking generally about 43,560 uh, square feet is um, some basic principles. I have some targets. Do you think we should talk about targets or? Um, Try and wrap you it. can throw them out and then we can rip holes in them if you want yeah let's, okay. <laughs> so, so this, this is, is not the albrecht test correct this is not the albrecht test do not look at this and say correct. when you get your logan report these are the numbers i'm targeting mm-hmm. right the whole thing i was saying about yeah different ways of testing different philosophical frameworks they don't okay. overlap so what you've got here is the reams targets Correct. Yeah. As interpreted yeah. by Arn, Arden Anderson, which what I understand is, he, I feel like he's trying to do a little bit of translation because when I pulled up the biological ionization book, it's got completely different targets in there. And so it's, this all gets just radically confusing, like radically, radically confusing. But generally speaking, this is the targets that is communicated through Arden Anderson of carry reams and pounds per acre. And then when we translate that to parts per million, um, those of you might catch that phosphorus and potassium change. And that's because of this other added nuance that when you talk in pounds per acre, they're referring to phosphate and pot ash, and that is not potassium or phosphorus. And you have to remove the oxygen and it gets way more complicated. That's, P2O5 is a much mm-hmm. bigger compound, heavier compound than phosphorus yeah. as an element. So, mm-hmm. I mean, the problem I, 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 when I teach my two day course, I spend an hour and a half on, on minerals and mm-hmm. It's always interesting to see because <clears throat> some people get really excited by the the philosophical like oh nature evolved plants to work in symbiosis with microbes and mm. it's about creating that dynamic where the microbes are flourishing and and just you know keeping the soil moist and other people are like oh two plus two equals four four mm-hmm. times eight equals you know 32. <laughs> mm-hmm. like some people really really love the numbers and you give them some numbers to respond to and they're like they just sort of like this is the answer i'm just going to get to that point and mm-hmm. Um, I just want to caution. Yeah, but, and I, I caution. think it's both. I, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. I, it's both because um, Sarah makes the example coming from the health industry, like, okay, that's fine that the heart monitor says it's great, but your patient has blue lips, like something is wrong. <laughs> and like, we still need to, as Arden says, see what we look at. And yes. eat. so we try not to get too hung up on the numbers, but we'll, what I will say is the groups that dis- disregard the numbers altogether don't typically have the highest performing results in my opinion. So you need to have the spiritual aspect, you need to have the energy aspect, but that doesn't seem to completely circumvent foundational principles of physical soil. Chemistry. Critical role of the physical plane as yeah. a piece of the puzzle. Yeah. And and I would emphasize one thing if I can emphasize anything, mm-hmm. and that is that I always work to address deficiencies. I always try to find the things that are low and bring them up. Yep. Never necessarily 
I mean, we can talk about max application rates per year because that's what something I learned from all the acres elders was mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how much calcium yeah. you need. What matters is if you're going to be using gypsum, thou shalt never use more than 500 pounds per acre per year, period. Um, that, that there's certain application rates of these materials on an acreage basis, which you shouldn't go past. So, um, so I would say my friends who are agronomists who are really good and, you know, I'm not that you're not good, but other people I've talked to when they are talking about what are the foundational struggles that are causal in disease pressure and pest pressure and things like that. They're like, it's almost always excess. For it's sure. almost always excess. For sure. That is the cause of the problem. Yeah. For sure. So you put, so nitrogen, people like love to put nitrogen on and a little bit is good. More is better. No, actually yeah. you can screw everything up by putting too much nitrogen on. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so gently working to, to fill the tank, but, but never letting yourself go crazy and say, well, it's just a little, a little bit more. It's not going to hurt. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it'll make things grow faster. Actually, it'll put everything mm -hmm. out of whack and you're going to have a bunch of problems because of it. So, yeah, I was, I was making a funny smile because, um, I was thinking of that federal project that I just had to use a certain lab for right. the yeah, yeah. projects and they were recommending 6,000 pounds per acre of gypsum to control, <laughs> to control the magnesium in those Hawaiian soils. And I was like, that's a long ways from 500 and uncle Dan. <laughs> <laughs> And it was, it turned into a four month discussion. I'm like, please construction company, you're going to kill the plants at this property. If you put, if you, I'm, I promise, I promise. Yeah, please, yeah. No, just it's please. not just a chemistry set. Yeah. 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 It was wild. And it was just, that's why I'm like, oh, that's 12 times what Dan just said. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. And we've, we've found, I'll, I'll have to do the translation later. I want to try and do it live, but um, I found that with gypsum, if you're applying more than 300 parts per million of sulfur at one time, it gets problematic. So it's probably translates to generally the same thing. Um, 300 parts per million wouldn't be, I wouldn't, I, I say I have a target of 75, which total is total parts yeah, per million. Conversation. Um, yeah. Which that's again from the Albrecht side. Yeah. I kind of, I, I, I started off with the dreams thing early on. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got enough pushback from people saying, where's your science? What's your science? That I just started teaching the Albrecht style. Oh. And I haven't really, it's been probably 15 years since I've done um, a lot of the beam stuff. So I'm kind of, kind of out of, out of touch. Yeah. Um, I would jump back into it because, uh, you know, it, we've gone too far down the rabbit hole of dis disregarding the energetic aspect of it. And we've gotten too mm -hmm. swing the pendulum back towards the middle of, you can't ignore these things. Like, like I said, literally every single thing I've applied from reams worked from my human health to soil health. It's all worked. That's the thing about reams. Yeah. It just works. And it's hard to, <laughs> It's hard to comprehend. The, bless his heart. That man was hard to follow. I have some of his uh, audio recordings from, uh, yep. I forgot who puts them out, but it's almost torture to other people when you put those audio recordings on. And I trudged through them like, you know, I was getting through the snow and pulled some good nuggets out of it's it. It's like, it's like reading, reading um, Steiner or something. It is. It's yeah. Exactly. Like it's, it's like reading Steiner. It's like you got somebody who's just way, way smarter yeah. than you are and who sees things on a totally different level and tuning into his brain and like being able to listen to what he's saying to requires a serious focus. Yeah. yeah. Well, and Reams jumps around a lot. He's clearly just, I guess, whatever's popping in from the universe, he spouts out <laughs> like readings. It's like, we want to make sure we got 1500 pounds breaker calcium. And I'm hearing that peaches in the spring. It's like, where are, we, <laughs> where are we going? And it's just like, Whoa, you know, so it's, it's kind of a trip to, uh, but I, yeah, I blasted through a lot of his stuff. I, you got to get that information and, Put it yep. Now on the contrasted side of that is the Albrecht, which is his big component is the base saturation. Would you say it's the balance? It's the levels and ratios of these key cations exactly on this, on the soil colloid. Um, and uh, I'm glad you're enjoying yourself, Joe. Yep. <laughs> feel, free to, <laughs> feel free to ask questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, you know, so these are, these are not fixed numbers. These right. are, you know, it's 62 to or 60 to 70 and, you know, nine to 15 and three to five for the, mm -hmm. um, you know, 0. 0.5 to three. Um, so this is what Albert found when he, when he was doing all of his original research in the, in the, in the thirties, basically was about, um, <clears throat> what were the levels and ratios of these elements on the soil colloid that connected to things growing well, not only in the plant, but also in the animal eating the plant. Right. And so maybe the first question to answer is what is a soil colloid and, there you go. um, 
you know, we throw these words around because we've been reading this stuff for 15 years. We know what we're talking about, but mm-hmm. don't necessarily assume everybody else does. Uh, the basic concept is that there's, um, I think it's electrons that are sticking out from the from the clay particle or from the silt particle upon which certain elements can bond. Um, the the vast majority of your soil, if you're dealing with soil, because I don't deal with the with the, like the the media that some people who are growing indoors use. I deal with soil. That's that's like really all I know really that much about. Um, and you know, the vast majority of what soil is made out of is aluminum, silicon, iron, and oxygen. I believe um, the vast majority of like all the land that you walk on is made out of those four elements. Mm-hmm. 90, 90 plus percent of all the soil is aluminum, iron, silicon, and oxygen in some, in some ratio, depending on whether it's a granitic subsoil or a sandstone or, or whatever. Um, and you know, those structures, whether it's a clay structure or a silt structure or a sand particle, they have these sort of electrons sticking out of them upon which, um, uh, cations can bond. So, Calcium is one cation, um, uh, magnesium is another cation, uh, potassium is the third sort of major cation. Those are the, those are the three big ones that have that positive charge that can, that can stick on, that can attach to the soil colloid. Um, I think of it as the Knights of the Round Table, when I'm sort of trying to teach this metaphor, you've got a table with a hundred seats around it. Somewhere between 60 and 70 of those seats you want to have be calcium people. Um, somewhere between 12 and 18 of the seats you want to have them be uh, potassiums and somewhere between three and five, sorry, uh, magnesiums and somewhere between three and five you have to be potassiums. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't want all the seats filled. You want some empty seats. Uh, those are for, for, for reactions to occur. Um, but it seems to be, again, like we talk about with Reams, like if you just do what Reams talks about, things seems to, ter- things seems to work. Mm-hmm regardless of what your soil type is, if you can balance your soil to uh, an Albrecht cation exchange capacity in those ranges, um, things seem to work. Um, there's a couple uh, caveats. One is that the more sandy your soil is, um, the more magnesium you want. Um, so you want to have your magnesium more towards 18 as opposed to 15 or whatever. R12, um, and the more clayey your soil is, the more calcium you want. Um, Arden explained this to me um, from, I think he was talking about it from the perspective of petroleum engineers, Mm -hmm. people that are drilling for uh, drilling for oil. And um, I guess basically the calcium, one atom of calcium is bigger, like considered to be the size of a golf ball. Whereas the an atom of magnesium might be the size of a pea or a marble, and a, an, an atom of of um, potassium would be the size of a pea, so they're literally different sizes. And if you've got clay particles that are really you know layered close to, together, you've got a, a heavy thick soil, no air. You want to flocculate that soil. You want it to open up, and so getting more calcium in there to bond to bind to the soil to the soil colloid will functionally cause those different layers of clay to, to open up. And you can drive a tractor over it and that's not gonna squish it down because you've got a literally one atom of calcium between the, the platelets of clay and it's not, it's gonna bounce back, right? It's not, this is not about lack of air in the soil. This is about the sort of the chemistry of the soil. So um, that would be one key piece. If you've got a sandy soil, again, that's sort of a more loose soil and water doesn't hold in it. You want it to become tighter that's why you would add more of the magnesium because magnesium is a smaller element um, and that'll cause the soil to stay tighter, stay closer together, lose less water, uh, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And, um, u- and ultimately it's the, the push and pull of those forces that creates flocculation, right? So something about calcium and magnesium pushing and pulling <sighs> creates pore spaces. I thought it was, I thought it was had more to do with the actual size of the atom of the element that, <laughs> that, that calcium is just bigger than magnesium. And so if you want your soil to be tighter, you put in more of the smaller elements. If you want your soil to be looser, you put in more of the bigger elements. So a clay soil, it's gonna have more like 70 or 72% calcium and you know, a sandier soil will have, will have lower levels. Um, yeah. If you wanna 
if you want to make a hard like a, a driveway in your field you want that field not to be muddy you want to be able to drive your tractor back and forth on this one line then you would put a bunch of magnesium down a bunch of epsom salt down will cause your soil to get really tight <clears throat> then it won't get muddy i don't know these are just little sort yeah. of tricks but um yeah they do that in uh, south america to make roads i believe too they you they literally use mineral amendments to change the chemistry to create a hard pan and magnesium i think is what they is what uh, arden always told us yeah is what you can use to tighten the soil um and yeah so then those, those are the major cations um the sodium you've got it written on there is point 1.5 i think i think i always think of the range i don't think of those numbers as fixed like 62 12 5 i think of them as ranges for sure um, and so for me if I've got a sodium level below 0.5, I will always recommend, totally. I suppose it depends on where you are um, in the country or geographically. If you have you know more than 20 or 30 inches of rain a year, um, I'll always recommend 75 pounds of sea salt when I see a lower, a lower sodium level. Um, around here in the East Coast where it rains a lot, you might get higher sodium levels in a hoop house, but you're never gonna see them outside. Um, unless someone's doing a lot of sea salt, but out west where you guys live, um, I'm guessing you get higher sodium levels pretty re regularly. Um, yeah, but again, you're dealing mostly with indoor growing people who don't have rain. Well, so. I, I mean, I, I yeah, clearly the bulk of my experience is in cannabis cultivation. But in the last couple months, I've done federal projects. You know, we we do a whole bunch of everything, but um, we get we get the most performance and fastest growth out of the cannabis, and and I think personally the rigorous and the testing has demanded radical evolution because it's, we're literally, you know, you got to thread and thread an airplane through a fiery hoop in order to sell your, <laughs> so like, and then all the, also there's repetition. So <clears throat> we get between four and five, four and five harvests in a calendar year from each cultivation space. So if that's an indoor room, a greenhouse, a plot, as long as the environment can be controlled with lighting, we can get multiple um, harvests. And the, the biggest facility I've ever worked with had 26 rooms that all got five harvests in a calendar year. So uh, whatever 26 times five is, 110 or something, that's how many crop cycles we got in one year. And that's a lot. 130, of, yeah. <clears throat> like, that's a, that's a lot of experience. And so, um, but... We, we do a little bit of everything and here in here in here in Utah, you know, I guess what's left over from when this used to be an ocean, there is quite high salt in the soil here, um, which is interesting because we get a tremendous amount of snow. And like I just watched five feet of snow disappear in the last two weeks. It's clearly flushing out the root zone. And, you know, when in that case, you you would think that it would keep flushing it out. Um, but it is well, I think it has to do with whether the majority of the water leaves through going down or through going up. Uh -huh. And so if you're, if the, if the water mostly leaves the land through, through evaporation, then whatever salts are, or nutrients are soluble in solution will be left on the soil surface as right. that little sort of like that white salt crystal. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, do you, do you lose most of your water through evaporation or through, or through leaching? And that's a that's a good question. I just assumed it was going down, but it's so dry here. No, 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 no. That's where you guys are. It's all it's all. I mean, some may go down, but the vast majority of the water you lose goes up. You lose through through evaporation. That's why you have these high mm -hmm. salt levels. That would make um, sense because that's also high, high pH. Yeah, that's also what they talk. Yeah, it's high pH too, and that's also what they mm -hmm. talk about with watering. Is if your if your water is high in sodium, doing small amounts is going to build up that sodium. Drawing large amounts will tend to drive it down or push it through a little bit so that, that makes a lot of sense yeah um yeah so, so there's different recommendations for different parts of the country I and mean, we're talking about we're we're talking about americans right now in north america but mm -hmm. these principles apply wherever you are globally mm -hmm. i think it's somewhere in that you know 20 plus or minus inches of rain a year mm -hmm. is where you shift from from the high salt content generally higher mineral levels higher ph um you should be concerned about putting things on um because they can build up more rapidly versus where we live. If I live like 40, 50, 60 inches of rain a year, mm. um, you don't need to worry about salt buildup. <laughs> no, what about. you need to worry about is sulfur and boron and molybdenum and <laughs> right, right. keeping things in the root zone is your problem. You, uh, anions leach, right? We talked about the cations mm -hmm. will, will 
bind to the soil colloid, but the anions won't. So there's positively charged elements and negatively charged elements, um, um, which has to do with whether they've got, you know, an almost full, um, what's it called, orbital or just a couple extras. Um, <clears throat> I don't need to go back to the basic chemistry, but um, things like boron and sulfur, um, molybdenum uh, are examples of elements that are anions. And if it does rain a lot, oftentimes are, are critically deficient in your soils. Right. So I can tell anybody who's living in the pretty much east of the Mississippi, if you haven't addressed a boron deficiency or a sulfur deficiency or a molybdenum deficiency, I don't need a soil test to tell you. I can pretty much guarantee you you've got one. Um, and so, um, yeah, there's just different, different elements, different regional dynamics, et cetera, to deal with. Nice. Um, and even within potting soils, so in the potting soil world, if it's more peat moss base or it's more cocoa core base, it requires slightly different, um, targets, but they're fairly similar. Uh, we tend to need more potassium. So instead of maybe four to 5%, we go from four to 7%. And if you stay mm -hmm. a little bit higher, like five to 7%, it performs better, but man, you want to induce a pest problem, surpass 7% on potassium. It's a real good way to do it. Uh, and seems to be pretty consistent across all properties. Uh, we do see which, which a lot of compost will do for you. Yeah. And right. A lot of, so compost is high in phosphorus and potassium mm -hmm. and people are like, Oh, some compost is good. More compost is better. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, you got lots of weed pressure, all kinds of things start to go out of whack when you put too much compost down. So yeah. again, to the boron principle, just yeah. because some may be good does not mean more is better. Yeah. I think a lot of people just don't, don't, um, have that context. Well, the last, the last thing I was gonna say about the anions is the mm -hmm. anions are, are held in the soil colloid. Uh, they're held in the soil through organic matter. Right. So um, if, if you've got stable organic matter, that's what's going to keep your boron and your sulfur and your molybdenum in the soil colloid. Um, <clears throat> the lower the organic matter is, the more likely they are to leach out. Right, right. And it plays into their availability too. It's not just that they're, they're going to stick around. I, we definitely see when organic matter is higher, you get more productive capability uh, yeah. doing it's doing something else that I don't fully understand. But um, do, you, do you want to go <laughs> some, some what soil tests look like? Or do you want to go to over some numbers? What do you think would be a good place to go from here? I think, I mean, I wouldn't mind just going through a few more targets as far as the Albrecht style, at least like how much sulfur we're looking for, how much okay. boron we're looking for. You've got a couple numbers there on your, on your sort of target number, but I think it would be great to, yeah. <clears throat> you so, know, we can disagree and people can understand that it's not like it's a, no. it's a, a fixed science. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is kind of my sheet that I use for the soil balancing class. And what I've got here on the right, this is out of the ideal soil. And the reason why, the reason why I reference the ideal soil book is because it's the only published thing I've found that's like, here, this is how to do it. Um, so I'm having trouble zooming. There we go. And so these are the, these are the uh, Albrecht principles using something like Logan Labs, uh, running the Malik 3 test as a target, um, which is kind of some of the stuff here that you've, um, you've mentioned as far as base saturation. Uh, yeah. I got too many screens open. I can't see myself. There we go. Um, so there's just some basic principles with some I agree, some I disagree moderately, some I disagree strongly with. But what I will say is if you're not doing anything, and you move to this, you will absolutely radically improve results. Yeah, I would say looking at that, what you've got there, I would totally agree those ranges are, are healthy ranges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then what's really interesting about Albrecht's book is he shows pictures of these different crops grown at these different saturations. So the distribution of yeah. what's there and um, below 65 calcium, below 60% calcium, definitely you start to have some significant impacts on productivity and in one of the books, the phrases, some plants struggled to grow true to type when calcium got below a certain level. And so in, in potting soils, we find that once you start to drop below the standard target of 68, all that starts to happen below 65 for sure, below 60, good luck controlling mite and mold pressure. Um, this, let's just stop, stop, stop with calcium for a minute because it's a really important element. Everybody understands who's mm -hmm. in this world understands the importance of it, but mm -hmm. a lot of others don't necessarily. Um, okay. Critically important. You know, I, where I live here in New England, our pHs of our soils, if you if you just take an old farm field, <clears throat> you're four and a half, 4.8, 5, 5.2, mm -hmm. 
pH, oftentimes you might have a, a 45 or 50% base saturation in your, uh, of calcium in your soil. Wow. And, um, you know, I think it was, um, Cornell that I was reading this, this, like they had like a monthly newsletter or something. And there was this whole, the whole newsletter was about this miracle, this miracle thing they'd figured out was like, it connected to this positive thing and that positive thing and that positive thing, that positive thing. They read the whole, the whole issue was about this magical miracle amendment. And then right at the end, they said, it's calcium. <laughs> um, <laughs> because the Southern tier of New York is like totally weathered and, and low pH. And there's a lot of, a lot of land out, which is like, it's just weathered low pH soils and calcium deficiency is critical in that, in that conversation. And so, um, <clears throat> yeah. And, but the other piece of it is there's different types of calcium or different kinds of calcium, mm -hmm. um, which again is something I don't think I've necessarily totally integrated, but I know it's true. Um, you know, limestone, for instance, comes in two different types. There's, there's calcium carbonate and there's calcium magnesium carbonate. Mm -hmm. So one's called calcitic lime and one's called dolomitic lime. Um, the dolomitic lime, the calcium magnesium carbonate has, uh, a bunch of calcium, a bunch of magnesium in it. Some percentage of it is, is magnesium. I don't recollect immediately what the percent is. Um, Reams was like, thou shalt not ever use dolomite. Oh. Um, he was just, do not use dolomite for whatever reason. So um, if you're out here in Massachusetts and you are saying, I've got a low pH, and I need to lime my soils. Well, the closest lime quarries we have are dolomitic lime quarries. And we already have enough magnesium. We don't have enough calcium. So when you're putting dolomite down, you're accentuating the imbalance. Yep. Um, so understand there's different types of limestone, but then there's gypsum, there's aragonite, there's carbonatite, there's all these different materials that are calcium containing materials. And um, <clears throat> I'm fairly certain from the Reams perspective, you know, especially, but in general, that the more different types of calcium, like calcium sulfate is different than calcium carbonate. Um, Right. And so they're different chemistries at different, they, they solubilize at different, at different speeds, um, the different spins. And so I'm not sure we have time to get into that nuance of how to make your own recommendations here at this moment, but, um, understand that all calcium is not uniform, right? All, all just because it's got calcium in it does not mean you can count it. Um, so say elemental sulfur is, you know, is if you want to build your sulfur levels over time, using elemental sulfur is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. If you think, I'm using magnesium sulfate or copper sulfate or um, potassium sulfate, and those all have sulfur in them, then that counts as me building my sulfur level. Actually, it gives you available sulfur this season, but it does not build your your, your reserve sulfur level. So um, these are just nuances that, I mean, maybe we don't have time for this whole conversation today, but it, it just the more we can bring these topics up and name them and get people to hear having heard them, I think uh, the better. So. Yeah, and I, I think an important thing, if you take nothing else away, at least try to diversify your calcium sources between one that's longer term, like a limestone, an oyster shell, a bone meal, yeah, something that's more micronized water. So like a micronized limestone, a gypsum, like it's very difficult to simultaneously build up soil reserves and satisfy the current nutritional needs with available forms just using one thing. And that, you know, at least at least try to diversify is always good. Um, yeah. Something that I think is really I will say carbonatite is my favorite calcium source that I come across, yeah. which comes out of, out of, out of um, Canada. It's a paramagnetic um, mm -hmm. volcanic calcite, which, you know, wrap your what that means. It's volcanic and paramagnetic <laughs> and it's got 10% trace elements. Like 10% of the product is, is trace elements like, like azomite or, or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and it's been pre-digested by microbes. So it's extraordinarily bioavailable. Mm -hmm. um, if I if I had to choose one one calcium source mm -hmm. that I, I and I'm just I just told you you shouldn't use multiple calcium sources, but if I had to choose one, that would be it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not the kind of thing most people have heard about. It's not the kind of thing that's regularly available, but um, <clears throat> it's a wonderful material. Um, yeah. I've never I've never heard of it until you mentioned it in one of our calls with the BFA. Yeah definitely interested in carrying it that sounds exciting. yeah i've got a few tons in my in my barn um but yeah that was when that was the one that i when i when i put i, th I can't remember if it was maybe about a thousand tons to the acre down on a on a hay field 
it was an old worn out hayfield. It was it was brambly and brambly and and goldenrod and stuff. Um, hmm. In the fall, the next spring, it was red clover. It just completely shifted the the plants that were growing there um, in in one in just over the winter. Really, really impressive. Moved, moved it through succession. I think. Yeah. One, <laughs> I didn't plant clover seed. Yeah, <laughs> it's just <laughs> and along with nutrition. Which I think yeah. I think one takeaway, like you know, obviously there's different literal languages of mineral chemistry. One thing I think they all agree on is that there's relationships. So this yeah. this is talking about different targets based in relationship, and then this Albrecht or well, this I guess would be this is Reams. This is Reams. This two to one P to K is Reams. Yeah. <clears throat> And that definitely, now this gets complicated because you're talking about phosphorus or potassium or potash and so then it changes the ratio a little bit. But importantly, as potassium goes up, phosphorus needs to go with it, as does sulfur, um, as does iron. And then the trace minerals are anchored to each other. So uh, yeah. iron and manganese work together and against each other. So as iron goes up, if manganese doesn't go with it, they start to antagonize each other. Uh, yep. Zinc is anchored to phosphorus, copper is anchored to zinc, boron is uh, uh, anchored to calcium. I think that's the real yep. strengths of this chart, and I find this is pretty true from farm to farm to farm. Um, mm -hmm. and well, can we? That, that was we went through that fast. Do you want to try right. to give people numbers? Sort of. <clears throat> yeah. If, we, if people who are listening are trying to take something practical home from this, like what does that mean? Um, I guess maybe you've you've got a chart. That is with like with the, with the targets all right, right yeah, th there. this is my so this is my adaptation of the various targets distilled down into my practical results um and because i work with such a diverse network that it's not one target um it's um potting soil is it native soil is it sandy soil is it you know and one of the you know there there's certain things that tend to be consistent in my work. And this could be we're in a different era, there's more degradation, there's more chemical damage, there's more toxicity in the environment, maybe you're needing more minerals. I personally find that like below 100 parts per million of sulfur, things tend to be a little bit more moldy. Uh, they tend to battle blights a little bit more. Um, so pretty much every situation I try to keep sulfur and phosphorus above 100, which is something we've talked about. Some of these say 50, you're, you're um, History says 75, which isn't much different than 100. Um, well, I wouldn't say, I mean, I'm just thinking maybe our next presentation or next oh. conversation can be, I'm already, I'm already like, <laughs> yeah, let's get, let's get 10 soil tests. Okay. And we'll just walk through them one at a time and make our recommendations and okay. explain to people why we'd make which, which recommendation. And if they wanted to learn by listening to us, walk through 10 soil tests, actual reports, you know, like. Like I would do this and you do that. And the, um, that's how I learned to be a consultant. We do that right now, Dan. We can do that right now. Well, <laughs> what do you want to queue up? I think, I think we've got, I think, no, we had your whole thing about weight we have to get into today. Okay. This is a conversation that we're going to keep going on for a long time. Let's go back to where we were. Okay. I would just say about, so about sulfur, um, around here, if I see sulfur levels at 25, I'm impressed. Mm. Almost everybody's sulfur levels are like eight, 10, 12, 15. Wow. And so, getting them up to 75 is like good luck wow. you know so if we can get it up to 50 that's great mm -hmm. certainly sulfur is critical for all kinds of you know enzymatic processes of building complex compounds and, and things like that mm -hmm. um but so as i said earlier when i'm trying to get you know if i if i do the math on how many parts per million of sulfur i need to get to 75 and i and i'm understanding that elemental sulfur is the material that is most likely to get you that systemic improvement <clears throat> i might i might be recommending 200 pounds per acre or something like that 300 pounds per acre and i would even though the math might say i need 200 pounds per acre of elemental sulfur i would never recommend more than 75. Sure. Um, so just going through element by element um and talking about how we're gonna do that again i don't have any experience with potting soil uh yeah. sort of the, the you know the, the growing medias and stuff like that so i can't speak to that i'm just talking about about land yeah, and and what's what you're saying is there's there's max application limits, and it's even different for each element. So you could yeah. pop on several thousand pounds of calcium and not probably cause any problems other than disrupting balance. 
But you put, like you said, 7,500 parts per million of sulfur, you're probably going to burn most vegetable crops, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so th how I break this down is, again, I'm trying to teach a class that, you know, I've got a hay farmer, I got a cannabis farmer, I just did a um, uh, runway extension <laughs> for an international <laughs> airport <laughs> that required yeah. chemistry. Same general <laughs> ideas, but different targets. Um, and so what I've got here is in native soil, this is kind of my general baseline. And then we've got, I've got two phases for potting soils. And the reason why I do that is the cannabis industry is dead set on maxing out everything. And I personally believe that you should balance to a lower target first. Yeah. Get that consistent. And then once you've managed variation, which is a whole three hour conversation in itself, once you've managed variation, then you can start to go to higher and higher levels. But almost every class I've taught now, there's at least one person in there that goes straight to max application limits. And that's, that's not the way to go. Um, a yeah. couple things that I've kind of figured out that, uh, slightly changing the ratios that if you would get sulfur equals the phosphorus equal to potassium, you increase the level of negatively charged items, which allows you to run higher levels of calcium, magnesium, potassium without driving the pHs up into the eights. Um, which is a significant advantage in the potting soil world. Again, comes back to something I think we both agree on is if you're disregarding the balance of what's there, you're missing the entire thing. Um, and it is a range and it does determine slightly, it, it is slightly different for, sorry, my little zoomer is having a hard time today. <laughs> um, sorry, I'll just leave it alone. But um, what I do find is in potting soils, it, it just simply requires more calcium because it's an unnatural substrate and it doesn't adhere to the compost and peat moss and cocoa core the same way that natural um, components do. So, well, what kind of calcium are you using? I personally use at least three sources in every single mineral recommendation. Uh, mm -hmm. For the context of regulated cannabis, it gets really difficult to increase nitrogen with blood meal, feather meal, you're just asking for um, pesticide, insecticide, oh, yeah. metal yeah. contamination. So that really only leaves you like fish meal, fish bone meal, which are pricey, but at our scale, they're appropriate. Those are those are calcium sources? The, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, that's one of the main reasons I, well, not the fish meal. The fish bone meal contains 4% nitrogen, 9% uh, phosphorus, and 20% calcium. So it gets me long-term bone calcium. It helps me build up phosphorus levels. And then you get nitrogen that's very rarely contaminated. Uh, yes. So I use that on almost every single recommendation. I use some oyster shell and some uh, gypsum on every single mineral recommendation that needs calcium. Yep. And what we found is because we're able to put more minerals on and we can build the higher levels, you have to now pay attention to, well, how much sodium are you inheriting from that oyster shell? So there's kind of limits to fish bone you can do per harvest. There's limits to uh, oyster shell, because keep in mind, we're doing this four crop cycles in a calendar year. So we're yeah. radically accelerating the process, which you have to be really mindful of contributing things that are problematic, which in living soil systems, sodium is one of the most problematic. Is not a lot, of, a lot of options. Except yeah, not, except for time. I never use any any animal products, any blood meal, bone meal, feather meal. Oh wow. Um, compost, chicken manure, none of that stuff. I'm right. like, I'm like a rocks. Give me some rocks, and um, like we'll get some mulch and let the earthworms digest it. Let the earthworm castings be the be the thing. Yeah, um, that's a good strategy. Yeah. We just uh, see now. It takes a little longer, I guess, to make it bioavailable. But if you're if you're composting, if you've got if you got earthworm if, any kind of earthworm system, um, where you're making work castings or whatever, then right. you can put it in there. Um, well, and, but, and you're getting a tremendous amount of water, which is accelerating that degradation. And then you're doing one crop cycle. So, in our experience, it it's very. If I'm, if I'm picking tomatoes off the plants for three months straight, yeah. Um, does that count as one crop cycle? Well, I. I mean, I get, I, it depends on how, yeah. well, 75 or hundred pounds of tomatoes off of one plant. Yeah. It takes, it takes a couple months for that to happen. I, I, I consider that to be just like, I want plants yeah. strong and functioning until it's too cold and they die. Totally. Uh, totally. Which I, I just want to clarify, you've mentioned that, like you had these results, 
and you mentioned that they were killed by the frost, which for those who are unfamiliar, that's a good thing. That means that they made it through the entire- As opposed to being killed by disease or insects. Exactly, right. yeah, and you've mentioned exactly. that before. And I just, for those that don't understand, that's that means he whew, s significantly went went through there. Um, so, so let's go back to that chart, because I'd love to go through just mineral by mineral. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, and you've got your targets. I mean, I can, I'll just offer my comments. Yeah. Um, so native soil I, I, is where I have my expertise. Mm -hmm. um, certainly I've seen native soils with exchange capacities of five and six, and I've yep. seen native soils with exchange capacities of 30. Mm -hmm. And exchange capacity has to do effectively with the size of the tank yep. um, is what I like to use the metaphor of. Like mm -hmm. if you've got a an F-350 on one side of a, um, at a gas station on one side of the, you know, the where you're getting filled up on the other side, you got a, you got a, um, a motorcycle, um, you know, the F-350 may be able to hold 20 gallons of gas. The motorcycle is only going to be able to hold one gallon of gas. And that's just the size of their tank and what they're capable of, of doing. And um, they can both maybe drive at 80 miles an hour, but one of them can pull 10,000 pounds and one of them <laughs> can have two people on it. Yep. And so a low exchange capacity soil is one that does not have a lot of bonding sites it can only it's more like that 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 motorcycle it's it's got a smaller capacity and the and the, the f350 might be like a heavy clay soil out west um yeah. so i would say the range in exchange capacity is much larger i definitely try to keep the ph range in a more uh, closer like 6.4 to 6.8 um yep. as a target i would say the organic matter percent i like it to be more like five at least um five six seven eight is what i'm aiming at uh, anybody who's at one or two or three I mean, they get basic system function, but you're not really ever going to get full system function um, as far as I'm concerned at that level. It's just not sufficient. And I'm not trying to build organic matter by adding compost. Um, I'm trying to build organic matter by growing healthy plants that are sequestering carbon through their plant root exudates. Um, so, so if you, I mean, you can, some people will, will make, they'll make garden beds and they'll put a, you know, two, wooden walls and and, uh, and two ends and they'll have something come in the back of a truck which is they call it soil and <clears throat> they fill it up and then next year it's you know two inches from full because a lot of that organic matter that was in the compost is now carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because it oxidized so i wouldn't call it stable carbon it may technically be organic matter but it's not real soil um real soil organic matter <laughs> Yeah, and we, we see the effects of that, it, like I said, radically accelerated doing four seasons in a calendar year. You really yeah. see what burns off organic matter and what builds organic matter. Uh, and yeah. the, the, we just had a farm that we've been working with for quite some time now that took a break from putting the leaf material onto the soil and more mulching, and their organic matter has taken a nosedive. And they've just had two harvests, putting leaf material back on, and now all of a sudden it's building back up, and they had a really like, whoa moment, you know? Um, yeah yeah but i mean are there people that are growing indoors that are using actual soil as a as a media i mean as a <clears throat> i mean no, subsoil and rocks and paramagnetic materials and stuff well, like that i mean it's... well yes and no so as far as like as far as like scooping dirt and putting into a pot when you put it into a pot those characteristics of soil that are good in the ground are very problematic in a container so, yeah so in a container and indoors specifically, it needs to be much lighter or else it's just kind of a muddy mess. And I don't understand why that, why it works in the ground. Maybe it's because it's got, you know, thousands of feet of whatever <laughs> doing something that I don't understand, but there's mag paramagnetism. There's, 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 uh, there's the, the, the tidal force. There's totally. Yeah. And so, yeah, but, but I, th I think I've heard of some marijuana growers who are doing that, who are putting, you know, paramagnetic rocks at, oh, yeah. as part of their thing and some kind of gravels and sands and, oh, yeah. and stuff. Is that not a, something you're aware of or? Yeah, sure. And I, we, I mean, yeah, most, most people in the living soil world and cannabis are incorporating some level of paramagnetic basalt. Uh, the problem then becomes is there's a whole camp that thinks that that's all that needs to be in the soil. And that does not perform very well. In my opinion, uh, yeah. you need to address cations and anions and trace. Hundred percent. Yeah. You can't just put 40 pounds per cubic yard um, of rock dust, which whatever 40 times 800 would be, that's how many pounds per acre they're doing. Let's see, yeah. 40 times 806. 
That'd be 32,000 pounds per acre they're using. <laughs> 30, that's, not, that's not too much. It's uh, only it's 15 tons. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that's a decent amount, but. That's a decent amount. Well, and so, yes, but what, what I see in the cannabis world specifically is significant bifurcations in what they do and what they focus on. Very few people put the comprehensive system in there. You need some lava rock for aeration and long term. Yeah. You need some physical clay. Uh, you need um, organic matter. De definitely some nice clays in there. Yes. Definitely some nice clays in there. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I do put clay. I try my best to incorporate the components of soil into the potting soil. And the difference between a potting soil with a little bit of clay in it and a soil that doesn't have it is pretty significant changes. Uh, the paramagnetic gets tough to measure because it's tough to get apples to apples to apples to say, uh, but I will say it absolutely contributes positively for sure. Um, mm -hmm. And there are people doing lots of things. The problem is in the cannabis world is that from the various cannabis gurus, they've been trained to ignore all this and to poo-poo people that do soil testing. And I would say in cannabis in the last couple of years, we're kind of in some of the worst results industry-wide while also having results we've better than we've ever achieved. So it's kind of a weird time. Um, and there's a lot of new people to the market. I've been professionally advising the commercial scales of cannabis since 2009. And this last year and a half, I've been working with un, undeniably the people with the least experience at that activity, uh, which is kind of an interesting time. So it's just, uh, it's going through a, going through a transition, which ultimately <clears throat> It's like childbirth. Something great's going to come out of it in the next couple of years, but uh, it's definitely bloody, and there's some <laughs> there's some suffering in the moment. <laughs> it's touch and go there. But, so, I mean, I just I'm really curious about yeah, like I mean, I don't I don't track this world at all, but mm -hmm. but the gurus, how does it work? I mean, somebody's charismatic. They've got a product. They they're selling a they're selling a, a silver bullet. Well, what what? How does it work that that people are? I mean, obviously, if you just don't know anything and just you got somebody who's telling you this is the answer, then you just listen to them. Do you want my honest? Do you want my most? I want your actual totally. I'm, I'm really curious. Yeah, I'm really curious. As as a person that analyzes every technique very intimately and watches it through its transition from yeah. early production to evolution, is I would say very clearly that once a strategy gets uh some momentum uh it gets subverted uh the term that was used yesterday or on a phone call last week is called astroturfing and so if you look at like the history when i came in in 2000 like to the public world of farming of 2012 or so like they would attack dr lane there'd be like websites attacking her uh when we moved into the instagram era it became paid accounts antagonizing people that were making benefit now what they do is they they prop up a guru and then they shift it off course and so they keep a little bit of truth they keep it to the heartwarming story and then they tell you uh strategies that very literally cause crop loss and so anytime there's tr very significant traction of something really providing benefit to the organic world it gets subverted and now with this like instagram social media it is so easy right now i'm just in awe of how quickly someone can pop up an instagram account pay for 30,000 followers and all of a sudden everybody they're moving markets It's pretty impressive work. Um, and I think the real problem with the organic agriculture is they think that everybody that speaks politely is for their benefit and that's being played upon like you would not believe. And so I've had to take several years off coming you know, speaking publicly because I just, it was just too problematic. I just going to let it work its course. Uh, but Sarah and I were hit by a semi truck in February in the two and a half seconds as that semi truck was approaching my truck at 50 miles an hour. It was all the things that I haven't been doing. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, <laughs> and it was like, OK, well, if I make it out your near death experience right there, yeah, like, man, it was yeah. all the things that I've been silent about. And it's yeah. difficult because the organic people get really manipulated. I bless their hearts. Um, and it's hard to, you know, that old saying, it's easier to fool someone than convince them they've been fooled. But it's a really interesting time for organic. And um, I've even seen people in the cannabis industry that were providing really good, actionable, solid advice. And then there's a point where they shift it. And it just becomes radically different advice that contrasted the stuff that I had personal phone calls with them about with projects. You know what I mean? You're like, mm, this is interesting. Um, but it's just best not to call those things out publicly. 
I've, I've learned personally. And it's just, uh, with regards to mineral chemistry, basically what's happening right now is, um, yes, we need to be intuitive. Yes, we need to not let data be the God. And yes, I think ultimately we're going to start incorporating the energetics back into it. But right now that's subverting success by discouraging people from doing the analytics they need to do to learn about their process. Yeah. Um, and it's created like, it's interesting how they play on the ego so hard. So it's like, like you're not a real living soil farmer unless you can, you know, judge by the wind. And so it's really, I can't, yeah. I can't, I can't, you know, taste a leaf and tell you what's wrong with it. Right. I've been farming for my entire life. <clears throat> Statistically speaking, uh, which what Sarah and I say is we believe that our work is recalibrating the intuition of the farmer. I don't want it to be, yep. I want you to intuitively know and be into, I want that, but we're a little disconnected, too much phone time. Uh, we've been separated from that a little bit. We need to get back our feet in the dirt. Um, but it's, uh, it's a crazy time for organics and it's crunch time, you know? And so, like I said, you know, in those last couple seconds before a truck approached my vehicle, 50 miles an hour, I was like, man, this is some work I got to go do. So that's what we're doing here with the show is we're getting to that work. Um, so glad you made it through that because you weren't supposed to, right? And this is one of those, like, I, there was an angel on both of your shoulders. Both of you guys said a couple of angels and you should not be here. Yeah, even so. my dog, even my dog made it pretty good. I mean, <laughs> there was definitely some consequences. I'm not going to say we came out like perfect, but uh, yeah, it was miracles all around. And um, yeah, I, for two days, I wasn't sure that I was alive. I'll be completely honest. I, for two whole days was like, I don't think I'm alive. You know what I mean? And then, then we were just like eating sushi and it like all kind of hit and it would like breakdown began. It was a pretty wild experience, but like, cause like in Beetlejuice, they like, they think they're alive and they're like, Hey, I hate to break it to you, but you guys didn't make it. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> for two days, I'm like, I just kept thinking about Beetlejuice. I'm like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, you know and then uh, can't put my hand through my arm can't, yeah, no, yeah. no it doesn't go through maybe, maybe it's true really not. so yeah that was uh so, so we're you know i guess but, i mean there's a really important point there about yeah. about how good information is taken sideways and manipulated and you don't what i think i just heard you say was you don't want to name names no you don't want to call people out That's but not. you're seeing this and you know, I mean, what, what's, what's the, um, what's the inoculant? How do we, how do we create a dynamic where, where people who are, um, looking for real information cannot can know they're not being taken for a ride or, or is it just, that's what happens with most people. They don't really know and they're just going to follow the lead and, you know, manipulation propaganda, you know, is so sophisticated at this point in time that, you don't need to convince everybody. You just got to convince 85% of the people who don't know any better. And as long as they're saying it loud enough and everybody else, then it's just, a, it's just a, it's a mess. And, and I'll be honest that I don't know all the answers. Like I, when I originally started this, my goal was to make the farms that were undeniably better than anybody else on the planet and let that drive the market. And to a certain degree that has absolutely done that, but it hasn't made near the effect that we intended. And those people that we worked with aren't sharing how they did that. <laughs> so um, it's kind of created this weird dynamic. My, my only strategy is you can't fight things. You can't push against things. That was my old strategy. Coming from Southern California, we're down for a bar fight. And so, uh, you know, I tried to take it head on, which was really only bad for my health. It didn't really move the needle at all. Um, and I played into the attack of me to where... Um, it made it easier for them to discredit me and realize I was just a terrible strategy. Um, so what I'm doing now is I'm just creating a force of people that are so remarkably educated to our degree that they, they what uh, that's the, what I can do. And so, you know, yeah. I've probably had a hundred people in the soil balancing class in the last year and a half that we've been doing it. Uh, a handful of those people are now professionally giving recommendations and are building their own client base. And that's that. I mean, I'm just trying to do what Arden did for me, what Reams did for me, what you did for me, what Dr. Lane did for me, and just make people so, uh, you know, in, you know, just so qualified in their understanding and education that no popular trend on Instagram is going to sway them. And then yeah. the more people that are driving successful results, because, you know, the real thing that I learned with the semi truck accident was like, I can't even quantify how much stuff Sarah and I know that we've never told anybody, you know what I yeah. mean? 
And it was like that, you know, you so much you can think about in two and a half seconds. It was like, wow, all this information is about to vaporize. Like it'll never go away, but you know, like it's always available in the consciousness, but yeah, I was like, Oh man, we got to get some. (laughs) So once I, once my brain kind of put it, you're back, you're back. (laughs) (laughs) Once my brain could compute complex functions again, uh, we're (laughs) we're starting to do this. And so um, that's what we're doing. And I just think the only way that you can do it is just, rise as many ships as possible and just dilute the message is the only way I've figured it out because I don't want to fight anything anymore. I don't want to try. No, to- fighting, fighting is not going to work. And, and I think, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, it's, I was, I can't remember who it was I was talking to. We had a chapter leader call last week. Um, and uh, one of the ladies was like, you know, I'd taken the, whatever, this course and that certification and this course. And then she came across one of my workshops and she's like, oh, I just wasted a lot of money. because. <laughs> When you hear the truth, you actually know it. Until you've heard the truth, you're easily you're easily like conned because this person seems so confident and you don't know and blah blah. blah and you're just like you're totally new to the space. But when you actually hear it, you're like, okay, that resonates a lot more well than this and this and this do. Mm-hmm. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, and yeah, then- and that's what I've been trying to do with nutrient density too. Is like exactly just create a framework where we have an empirical metric of what success looks like, and then it's not about what he said or she said or what this label. Or that label it's about the actual empirical empirical number um right but yeah well and the, the beauty of what you did with the bionutrient meter is and what what where it really clicked in me when you talked well, i can't remember when that was when we had the first conversation of what you explained that meter what it would do that's when it all clicked in me before i was just trying to win cannabis you know what i mean like i didn't really have like this bigger goal i was just trying to continually to provide support for the best in the industry which is what i've always done and now it was like, whoa, I can change the entire supply by changing the metric for quality. And if I can put that in the hand of the end consumer, like, and so through the testing in cannabis, we were able to do that quite quickly. We solved yep. that, all that conversation. And now, you know, I've, I'm having farms call me, like one of my buddies uh, runs the largest um, outdoor farm in California and their chemical And he called me about eight months ago and he says, all right, the team's ready to switch. Um, We're now seeing market prices at the dispensaries. The only product that's maintaining its value has these parameters of quality and has grown in this fashion. We're ready to make the switch. And, you know, they brought me out to their farm for the first time in 2018. They're just like, nah, not interested, you know. And now it's like, now the markets, it's not a core part of their belief. It's the market is making the decision for them. And that's that was always my 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 thought was it wasn't going to be people doing it for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's going to be them doing it because it's the only way to make a living and yeah. whatever. I'm if fine. we've created a reality where metrics are real mm-hmm. and and better is identifiable and the only way you stay in business is by hitting the metrics and those correlate with nutrition and soil health, then so be it. You know, not everybody's in, driven by saving the world. A lot of people are driven by paying the bills. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not neither one is right or wrong. They're just they're just reality. So, yeah. well, I'll, I'll, you know, I was incredibly inspired by your message on and your purpose and your methods and your approach for trying to modify the food system. And prior to that, I was just trying to be good at a career and have a nice life. And it was more ego based of like, well, I'm working with the best. I'm doing the best and we're getting the best. But then it was like, if I just make a slight shift in my approach, I can actually have worldwide change. And that's pretty damn. Yeah. You know, like Wouldn't that be fun. There's yeah, there's an ego trip for you. <laughs> <laughs> Which there's still plenty still plenty of ego involved. Don't <laughs> and it challenges me at least year at least once a year. It, it sucks me <laughs> every time. You're like, okay, what are we doing? Are you doing this for ego? Or are you doing this for you know? And yeah. it, it well, I think ego's got its place. Everything's got its place. It just has to be. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Anyway, we've digressed from our man. From so our far, it's, it's okay. I, I hope people are still following along. We can cut it out. I think I think it's good to balance the balance the numbers with the with mm-hmm. the stories. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I guess to wrap up, I think we, you know, we can do a whole session and really deep dive. But the general concept is you need you need a balance. You need a balance of what's there. Um, yeah. Relation- can we just talk about the trace elements for a second? Yeah. Let's before do it. we run out of time. Yeah. I'll just offer my my numbers, and you can talk about yours. But I just. Um, I see you're at one to four, two to four with boron. I usually say three is my target in a soil. Um, again, that's oftentimes uh, people are usually at like 0.1 or 0.2 or 0.3. So they're like a long ways out. 
Um, I think my, my max application rate is uh, 15 pounds per acre of solubor or boric acid, and mm -hmm. it's 30 pounds per acre of um, borax. So if you're using either of those materials, um, whatever, those are just general targets. Um, but if you're down, if you're down at that 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 range, then you can do max application rates for a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, iron, I oftentimes see iron levels at around 150, 180. Mm -hmm. um, and we showed previously the ratios of two to one with the iron to magnesium, uh, manganese. Yep. So that oftentimes will then mean that I need to target manganese at like 80 or 90 totally. parts per million. Um, I, I say 40 pounds per acre of manganese sulfate is your max application rate per year. Um, and so, I mean, it's a question in most cases of budget, are you willing to go that far? Right. Um, but I think I told the story last time. Did I tell the story about the guy with the tomatoes that had experimented with a bunch of magnesium at the end of his um, garden bed, a uh, manganese? Yeah. One of our board members at Derek Christensen at Bricks Body Farm in the South Coast of Massachusetts was a He's been studying all this stuff for many years. Um, his, his name of his farm is Bricks Bounty Farm. He's, he's definitely on the on the bandwagon. And um, he was doing an experiment with manganese, uh, which is a reproductive element according to Reams. And uh, he had everything else dialed in. And he's like, as a good scientist would do, he was gonna experiment. And so he, instead of doing 40 pounds of um, manganese sulfate per acre, he did 400 um, at that very end. And uh, the fronds on the cherry tomatoes instead of having like 15 or 20 uh fruit per frond they had about um 100 so we did 80 and 100 right. fruit per frond so we quadrupled or quintupled these yields by actually having a manganese level um at the level that was where the plants could use it to realize their full potential so in many cases these targets are um <clears throat> well i'll just say that i'll just say that on manganese um yeah well, we use it a lot that. in cannabis because just like you said, it increases, we call it a uh, flower set. So it increases yeah. nodes that ultimately become yield and it keeps yeah. them closer together so you can make more of them. And yeah, it's yeah. a it's the fruiting energy, the fruiting totally. energy, according to Reams. Yeah. Totally. And yeah. like you said, for some reason, iron comes in the water, comes in the rocks. I don't know where it's, that's the least common element that we're adding iron. Um, iron is one of the things that the, that the, that the planet, that the soil is made up of. I think I said iron, oxygen, silica, and um, uh, and uh, aluminum yeah. are the four things that the soil is made up out of. That makes um, sense. so undeniably yeah. the least common thing I put on a recommendation. Every now and then, maybe a couple times out of a hundred, manganese is higher than iron, but very rare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so zinc and copper, I have a target of five and five and ten. Yep, and that yeah. same that same two to one ratio. Um, aluminum, um, when you're dealing with soil. Uh, aluminum oftentimes will have around here uh, 800, 1,000, 1,200 yeah. ppm of aluminum. Yeah. And to my knowledge, that is a symptom of a weathered and worn soil. Mm. Um, you'd like the target to be below 200. And uh, what I see when people start to get, as the biological system begins to kick into gear, the aluminum levels will begin to drop. So it'll go from 1200 one year to 1100 to 1000 to 800 to 600 um, as the soil life is tying up that available aluminum, um, which is a toxin in many cases, and it's a, a symptom of weathered soil. So you've got a blank there. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but I'll just I'll just say that when I see that, that's usually a symptom to me of a, of a, of a weathered a weathered soil. Yeah. Um, cobalt and molybdenum, I think I've got targets of, of two and maybe it's 0.5 on those on those. Um, cobalt is of critical import due to the fact that it's a center of the B12 um, molecule, which is a foundationally required for all life, not all life, but basically all life to exist. And so a cobalt deficiency will cause a microbe deficiency, which will cause everything else to not function, um, which is remarkably, remarkably um, important. I will recommend up to four pounds of cobalt sulfate per acre if you can afford it. Mm -hmm. um, and then molybdenum is the center of the nitrogenase enzyme, which is critical for nitrogen fixation. <clears throat> I think I said I don't add nitrogen. I don't believe in adding nitrogen. I pretty much just don't add nitrogen. Mm -hmm. um, my thought is if I've got enough molybdenum in the system, um, then I have then I then I and I have got I've got microbiome functioning, then my plants are able to harvest all the nitrogen they need from the atmosphere 
because it's not just the legumes that can harvest nitrogen from the atmosphere. All plants have that capacity, but they need the molybdenum there um, at the center of the nitrogenous enzyme because that's what the microbes use to do that job. So, right. um, and that's an anion again, which leaches. So anywhere where it rains a lot, you're going to have a molybdenum deficiency. 78% um, of the atmosphere is nitrogen. There's no shortage of nitrogen in the environment. Um, nitrogen excesses are causal in all kinds of imp uh, disease and pest pressure issues. So uh, using less nitrogen and making sure you got sufficient molybdenum um, might be things people want to consider. Yeah. I think I'll stop, well, uh, stop there. Cobalt yeah. is really important for the photosynthesis process, which is kind of also plant. photosynthesis. Yeah. 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 So uh, you're not getting energy into the cells without cobalt. Uh, and molybdenum and selenium, which the reason why I put greater than 0.5 is that's the detection limit. You got to at least be above the detection limit, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. In the last few years, I've been focusing more and more on cobalt, molybdenum, and selenium, and it just keeps getting better and better and better. Yep. And, uh, you know, especially in the indoor environment with the lights, even with the coolest technology now, we're a minor fraction of sunlight energy. And so you have to be extremely efficient with the amount of, uh, sunlight energy you're able to create indoors and that that requires a lot of trace minerals um one thing i will say about nitrogen though and that i agree like i agree in um concept with you that we should have these systems in place and let the natural system produce the nitrogen one thing i'm really uh i think good at is patterns and pattern recognition and yeah. undeniably one of the most consistent patterns in people that have come to me for the first time that have never done soil testing uh, that, that are just kind of scratching their head and can't seem to solve it. Their nitrogen's down below like 25 or 30. Um, and mm -hmm. it seems like, you know, and this is where I very radically veer away from, uh, you know, the soul food web advice of, you know, whatever, whatever, but, um, things that's the soul food web advice say it. Well, it's, uh, you know, that you shouldn't have to put on any of these things and then nitrogen, okay. which nitrogen yeah. is a byproduct of biological activity, but I would define myself as an expert in execution of biological technology. And when yeah. nitrogen <clears throat> soil is below 50, that system's harder to get started. When it yeah. drops below 50, 40, 30, and for some reason, 23, 25, the most, like if I were to aggregate all the soil samples I've done in the last eight years, the ones that were brand new people, they have, whoops, where's that coming from? Phone's ringing. Um, sorry about that. The uh, um, the uh, um, nitrogen is between 18 and 24. It's a really interesting yeah. pattern where it starts to nosedive, which, yes, over time on an ecological time scale, we can correct that. Again, in cannabis, we don't have the time for that. So we have to. If you're dealing with unnatural environments and you've got to keep things dialed in 100%. Me measuring, I mean, it's, 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 it's a really good investment is measuring, right? Having some baselines because you probably don't know as much as you think you want to think, you know, Yeah. and having some, <laughs> yeah, well, and it's but again, don't just send the, your soil off to university of California or university of Montana. Right. And you got to send it to the kind of lab that's going to be looking at it the right way to go back to that point. We started at the beginning, which um, is a big, leap for people, which yeah. is a big leap for people to be like, ah, okay. So you, you guy from the internet is saying that I should disregard the university. I'm like, well, yeah, actually. Yeah. I'm saying that systems rig. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah. Anyways, um, so I've got some soil tests. I don't know if we got time for those. Do we want to go over the weight? Uh, considering I think I think we should pick this back up again and do it and do and do more next time. Okay. I'm not sure how many how many people have have yeah, offered comments. I've only seen a couple well, so far. Some questions here. So um, so we've got one from Lisa. How do home gardeners avoid pesticide? Which is a two hour conversation. <laughs> uh, Okay, we'll put that on the agenda for future conversation. Yeah, <laughs> by having healthy plants. Yeah, the, uh, the right. short answer is you're not going to do it if you're not managing chemistry and if you're not paying to biology and if you're not paying attention to water chemistry because it's just too much to, too much to, too much to deal with there. But a great, a great conversation for the for that constituency. Yeah, yeah, which I'm not sure if we answered this one. Can you explain Reams avoidance of dolomite? Is it an energetic issue? Um, which and then he does, he does say in the book, so Sean's reading biological ionization right now, I believe. Yep. And I believe it, you know, he talks about getting magnesium from the air. Um, so I, I mean, as I said, it's been probably almost 15 years since I was head down in the reams work. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't 
I don't, I don't, I don't remember the exact details. I will say there's this thing called biological transmutation, which yeah. I think is a real thing. I agree. Um, and uh, the book there is uh, Kervrin, um is called Biological Transmutations. See Lewis Kervrin. Mm -hmm. and the and the basic concept is that um, <clears throat> atomic weight twenty eight plus atomic weight twelve equals atomic weight forty. And even though we can't do that as as humans, we can't make atomic weight twenty eight, atomic weight twelve come together to make atomic weight forty. Right. It seems like microbes can do that. Mm -hmm. um, they have the ability to. You know, we want this atomic weight twenty seven, and we got atomic weight thirty here. Well, let's you know we'll pull a <laughs> pull a helium off, or whatever a helium and a hydrogen off, and um, so the ability to and this is what isotopes are. If anybody's ever looked into isotopes, again, a totally interesting conversation that we can have time for later. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I don't know the answer specific answer to your question. Yeah. Um, We'll get back to it. I don't think he was against against all magnesium sources. I think he was very much against dolomite, is what I recollect. Yeah, I don't remember it, being against other issue. Magnesium I tried sources. to look it up. I tried to look it up last night. One thing I will say is, you know, when we got through the Dr. Elaine camp and we're fortunate enough to work very directly with her um, and have some really cool conversations, she seems pretty adverse to the concept of transmutation. But if I'm working with a soil that has cobalt below the detection limit and photosynthesis is still happening, please tell me what's happening. Like if well, uh, Jerry Brunetti did this test. He was doing this. I can't remember. He was doing something in, in, in uh, Appalachia. They were doing some coal mine um, re was ever like it was, it was a it was an old old coal mine. It was just a wrecked area, and they were trying to bring it back to life. And mm -hmm. and uh, I don't remember. I don't remember the whole story, but effectively, they had some potting soil and uh, or some soil. They were in a pot, and they did a soil test on it, and they couldn't find any boron. Um, um, and then they planted uh, nettle in it. And metal is known to be a boron bioaccumulator. And um, when they got done uh, growing the metal, there was boron in the soil. And so the question is, where did the boron come from? And it looks like the boron came from the act of the boron growing there. So when people talk about bioaccumulator plants, they aren't necessarily pulling things down from, a, from below and pulling them back up. They may actually be specifically capable of facilitating the transportation of these specific elements. So right. Right. again, I don't have the full citations on everything on that. I recommend C. Lewis Kerverin's work. Um, um, but I, it does seem to me that nature has some pretty powerful functions, uh, capacities that we haven't necessarily all been exposed to. Um, yeah. But there's good science to support them. Yeah. Um, and I, I personally believe it happens because nothing else seems to answer the question. If it's not transmutation, it's something else that's doing the stuff we don't understand, you know, like it's, it's stuff appears where it was not, <laughs> like where is it coming from? <laughs> Which is totally cool. And then they got to figure out how, and if it doesn't fit within your current paradigm, that means your current paradigm is wrong because yeah. it, it did happen. Then, then what, how, how did it happen? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Two to one PDK ratio. Um, that I'm pretty sure comes from the Reams work and is not part of the Albrecht story. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, you know, as I said, I have not been using that, so I can't speak much to that. Well, and is, and is it, are we talking about phosphate and potash? Because those are not one to one. And so it changes the ratio because phosphate is only 44% phosphorus and potash is only 83% potassium. And so my numbers are in parts per million, which has converted that to make it a linear relationship. So mm -hmm. in order to take phosphate in pounds per acre, you have to divide it by two and then multiply by 0.44 to get parts per million of elemental potassium. Phosphorus, pounds per acre, you have to divide by two and multiply by 0.83 to get it into elemental potassium. And it starts to throw off, <coughs> starts to throw off those ratios. So that's why I try to always uh, act in parts per million. To me, it's a common language. Pounds per acre is not a, not a linear language, although it might be easier for the casual farmer to say one ton per acre um, to me, I feel the math is more confusing. That's why mine is all, that's why I always speak in parts per million, uh, because it, um, cause it, to me, I get really obsessive about the math. I want the math to work out. I want the math to be direct. I want the math to be linear. I don't, you know, I don't want to be like this and do all these conversions and uh, some, and, uh, I don't know. I guess. So I don't, I mean, for me, I just use the base saturation. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> when I'm looking at a Logan test, if my potassium is below 3%, I say something's wrong. Right. Um, 
And if I see it above 5%, I say, you know, what have you been doing to cause it to be excessive? Right. I think I'm looking for 75 parts per million of phosphorus in the Logan test. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's a sort of a baseline. Um, <clears throat> I think that's phosphorus, not phosphate. So it would be more, more phosphate if you're looking. Um, but yeah, for me, it's a question of establishing baselines. I want to have, a, I, I want to ensure a critical level of things are present. And then I want to let life get out there and do the work. Mm -hmm. I have not dialed in the Reams um, understanding. And I think that's where the two to one comes from. Right. Um, and we, we could do, a, you know, I, you never know what people at the end of the YouTube want. Like if they want heavy data and analytics, maybe we can make a heavy data and analytics show. Cause clearly we didn't even have time to go through it all. We're, we're here now two hours. So maybe we just make a show and let it, let us know in the comments what you want to see from us. We're really just trying to dream this up as we go. And so we're relying on the feedback of the audience of where this show goes. Uh, we appreciate the people that join live and help direct the conversation. If you've missed it live, drop it in the comments and, you know, just tell us what you want to hear because, you know, there's a whole bunch of books between these two heads and it's like, <laughs> yeah, you know, and so I, I, I would like and to a bunch of and a bunch of friends and a bunch of friends in our overall circle. Oh. And the more we can engage this common, you know, <clears throat> coming together and sharing and learning together yeah. and finding and finding, you know, high ground, I think the better. I don't presume to. I mean, I know I don't know. No, um, I maybe have a couple ideas, but. Mm -hmm. If we get 10 or 50 people together and we find that we're like all kind of agreeing about that, then maybe we can say that's something that people can can listen to. Right. Um, Which it all comes yeah. down to, I, you know, I don't want to be a fear monger. We got limited time to act and I'm not going to just fade away like the cat's a pottinger. I'm going to make the old Yale. <laughs> and it's like this is species survival kicking in. You know what I mean? It's like we to me, this isn't a hobby anymore. This is like essential for human existence for us to figure this out. And I think. The timeline's getting shorter. We need more organic farmers interested in moving the needle like the Bionutrient Food Association is doing. We need more people. I pers I'm big on empowerment. Like I'm happy to do all the math for you, but I can only do so much in a day. Like I'd much rather teach you the skills to do these analytics your yourself because what, you know, an evolution comes out of that. You know, I took what you gave me. I took the Ardens. I took the, I put it all together and I've created my own functional system that works for my data and analytics and you know it doesn't need to mean that the evolution stops there you know like which we didn't get to today but we'll mm -hmm. must must do next time yeah we'll get your whole, the whole third section of our presentation our conversation we didn't get to today yeah and that's okay i think it's still fun <laughs> it's I, I yeah yeah totally. oh, it's, <clears throat> you know let us know in the chat if we did a stinky job let us know you know and and and, and it helps the algorithm it helps the show grow so you know like subscribe drop a comment we'll circle back around and We'll just keep evolving this channel to see what happens. Um, either way, I'm grateful, Dan, that you take the time to uh, share the message for those that aren't able to make it to your workshops. And uh, where, where are you going to be? Thanks for doing all the lick work. Yeah. <laughs> where, oh, it's fun. I mean, it's part of my role, I guess. Like I said, semi truck yeah. that I got to do it. So, <laughs> the, you know, I'm not going to mess with miracles. So if I got to. <laughs> well, I wouldn't gotta, recommend it. Yeah. I'm going to do it. So. Uh, that's what this process is. I don't even know where it needs to go, but here's the start. Let us know what you want to see. And Dan, again, thanks for joining. Thanks to everybody that joined us live and keep the comments and see you next time, I guess, whenever that'll be. Huh? Yep. Weeks maybe. Sounds good. All right, guys. Good. Thanks for tuning okay. in. Bye-bye.